All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending this intro to Dungeon Draft. Uh, my name is Jeff Todd, and I work at Morvold Press. We uh, and I uh, use a variety of different mapping softwares: uh, Wonder Draft, made by the same uh, company as Dungeon Draft, uh, as well as Incarnate. Uh, and I think basically, I'm going to walk through today uh, the basics of Dungeon Draft, how to get started, what it's good for and showing you some of the common practices that I use in building up maps. I think it's very useful to be able to see someone kind of working in real time uh, and have a chance to ask questions, understand decisions that they make. So I will start by showing you some of the basics and then hopefully we'll work on a project and just make something and we'll be able to see uh, some of the ideas in, in real time. And I will try to, as best I can, describe my process to you and decisions that I'm making behind the scenes so that you kind of understand that thought, thought process as a part of the overall workflow. Uh, for people who are brand new to Dungeon Draft, in terms of when should I use Dungeon Draft or should I use Dungeon Draft instead of Incarnate or instead of um, any of the other mapping softwares, my overall answer or response to that would be if you're doing a top-down map, a battle map, and especially an interior building map, I would say that Dungeon Draft is going to be one of the best ones out there, um, from what I've used at least, because it's of its ease of use. Um, there's many convenient features uh, that I find, um, and we'll just kind of jump in and get started so that we can see those. So when you open Dungeon Draft, you'll, you'll see this. Um, if someone could uh, comment quickly that you can just see the screen so I know you're, you're seeing what I'm doing before I get started. Yep, yeah, all good. All right, perfect. So um, you'll come to the, this will be your menu. Obviously, uh, I'm sure everyone's used to using applications. So I always just start with starting new. Um, there are some templates for sizes if you're you know designing a map specifically for say dis, you know a display on a television or a particular size uh, a map. I never worry about this. I I just want to create. Uh, the map. I'm worried more about the presentation, but obviously, if you design specifically for 40-inch TVs or um, for A4 paper dimensions, then then you have templates available for that. Um, you'll have a setting here for height and width uh, for the map that you want to create, and that'll basically create you know 35 tiles, uh, you know, uh, up and down and uh, left and right. Um, I tend to uh, you know make maps that are something like a 35 to you know 20 to start, um, and then size them out appropriately. Uh, it really depends on what you want to do. You can import asset packs. I am not going to be going over that uh, in this because I am not that great at it. I only use Dungeon Dra Draft uh, default assets. Um, there's also some map wizards that will like create automated you know, dungeon layouts for you and things. So that can be really helpful if you don't want to do it yourself. But I will show just how easy it is to do it. And so I think you won't be uh, uh, at all uh, intimidated by getting started with that. So let's just create a map. Uh, we're going to do 35 by 20 tiles. So I hit OK, and it will generate the map for me. And this is what we get. We basically get you know this grid. Um, it starts zoomed in. So a couple of quick things. One, if you hit uh, Control and Mouse Wheel, that will move you in and out of your map. Right, scrolling up and down, so I can I can drill in real tight if I want to, and I'll show when I do that, and you can uh, expand out. That's a you know real easy quick uh, uh, cut. And then um, I use spacebar. I think you can just hold down mouse wheel and move around. So I'm holding down the mouse wheel right now, and uh, and I can move around, or I, I use spacebar because that's what I learned first. So I can move dimensionally. So that way I can drill in, I can move around um, the map, um, which can be really useful when you're doing minute details. Another thing is you can turn your grid on and off. So if you don't want to see the grid, you kind of are doing more of a painting. Maybe you're doing like background or terrain, and so you're really just trying to understand the visual. You can turn the grid off. Or if you're building out a dungeon or you're building out something where you want to understand the dimensions um, better visually, then you can have the grid on. I, when I do my work, I tend to use the grid um, for sizing. So for example, um, and we'll, we'll get to the workflow, so I'm going to jump around just a little bit. But if I go and grab an object, and we'll say a bed, for example, I will pick the object tool um, over on the right hand. All my assets will come up. I will scroll down to where the bed is or the, the suite of beds that I have a choice of. I will pick one. Um, so when it comes out, then I'll say, OK, well, if, if one of these squares and what I do is I, I size it basically with five feet in mind dimensionally, but I that doesn't mean that when the map is finished that every square is going to be literally five feet. Certainly people can regrid it themselves. I mostly do it just for trying to keep my whole map uh, 
dimensionally accurate, you know, and, and that they relate to one another. So um, when I make my decisions, generally I find that like 0.65, um, and I'll go over this uh, later, but uh, that this size um, tends to be pretty, uh, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, some of these uh, different assets will be a little bit different, um, but I want it to be a little bit past, you know, five feet. Um, so the, yeah, so a little bit past five feet. So maybe it would probably be maybe six and a half, seven feet in total length if I were to do that. Um, that way, uh, I feel like it's dimensionally pretty accurate. And then when I'm placing other objects like chairs and tables and benches, I can just refer to you know that object. And I, if I do that throughout the whole map, then all of my maps should kind of have the same convention. Um, but in general, that's how I use these grids um, from an object placement standpoint. I use it both as a you know reference point in space and also to you know show me uh, if I'm making a dungeon, I, I like to see the grid nature of it. But it also helps me with placement and sizing of assets. So I just wanted to mention that quickly. I will mention another thing that took me a while to learn, and I know a lot of people struggle with it too. As you see that I'm dragging this asset around, you'll notice that it kind of like skips and jumps because it's moving to basically a, a vertice or, or a, a specific point on the grid. I don't have kind of smooth control over where this is. And that's because of this thing down here called snap. So you can click snap on and off. If I, it's default by default, it turns on. And I think that messes a lot of people up because they think that that's how it is, that placing assets is like this. And so when they make a table, and a table is a great way to show how this can make people think that uh, Dungeon Draft is maybe more frustrating than it is. So I make a table. Well, I, I, it only allows me certain places to place my table, so I'll put it here. And then if I want to put chairs around my table, I scroll up to a chair, and I find that, well, I don't want it to be on the table, and maybe I don't understand yet about how the layers work. So really what I end up doing is something like this. You know, I make this gigantic table. Right, and that doesn't look particularly good, and it's not what I want. Um, but then, if I say, "Well, I want that chair to be closer," and I try to move it, because uh, I guess that works, but this, you know, this this won't work as well, and that won't work as well, and that's because snaps on. If I turn snap off, then it'll let me move the asset wherever I want, right? And I can move them closer to the table, and that looks better, but it's still not as good as it could be. Um, if I remove you know, some of these and start over here. I'll talk a little bit about layers. I'm going to get much more uh, detailed once we get started, but I just kind of want to make a quick, quick mention of how that works. So layers, um, you have control of layers up here. You'll see there's a big laundry list and I'm going to go over all these more in depth later. Um, but the, as you can see, it's basically tiered. So it starts with your terrain and then works with ground and caves and flooring that you would put down water or below water level, water level, and then object layers. And these are going to be ones you use the most. Um, and then above walls. And all these are all these important and we'll, I'll show examples of all these. But for this purpose, within each of these, within below water, within level one, within above walls, you also have an over and an under to choose from. So for example, this table was set down in layer one. And if I put a chair here, because it's on over, it will put the chair over the asset that's also on layer one. I can hit undo and get rid of that. But if I choose under, then it will let me put my chair underneath the table. And that allows me to make it look like these are you know, slid underneath the table, which I find to be a much better presentation, say, of a table in a room. Um, so that's just a, a tiny bit um, on some conventions that I get tripped up on when I started was the snap especially. Um, was, was This also uh, has a lot of effect if you're wanting to place walls and things of that nature, and we'll get into that here in just a second. But uh, I wanted to make the point about snap, and then since we're here, obviously, uh, just mention layers a little bit. But we'll, uh, we'll do that a lot more when we start you know, actually making something. So um, to begin... I think I'm just gonna kind of walk you down this list of tools first from a broad perspective. So the, on the left-hand side, you have basically your, your tool palettes uh, of the various things that you'll do when you're building. Um, the first one is your design palette, if you will, or your design uh, menu. Uh, and what you have is a building tool, a wall tool, a portal tool for doors, windows, things of that nature, a cave brush. So this is for making those quick subterranean uh, dungeons and things of that nature, a pattern shape tool, and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between that and the building tool. Uh, so we'll start with the building tool. You select the building tool and it will open up into this interface where you can choose what shape you wanna draw with, which is square shapes, circle shapes, and then a kind of polygon freeform. Um, edit points, we'll talk about that, uh, but basically after you lay down a shape, you can use edit points to change your shape around. And then you have object uh, uh, flooring, 
So you have, you know, wood floors, stone, various stone floors, a carpet tile, um, some tiles, floor or carpet, uh, sorry, flooring, um, like some broken wood, um, like a sewer tile, lots of different options for putting it down. So let's just put down a floor so you can see what that looks like. So um, below the, you, you choose your floor, which one you want. And then down below, you also have a choice of walls. So you have battlements, cobblestone, concrete, stone, and wood. And I definitely, I generally choose these based on the kind of dwelling that I want to make. And I'll maybe quick show a quick example. If I want to make a, like a rundown castle or something like that, I might pick cobblestone and maybe something like a uh, cave floor. Um, so that, and, uh, and maybe we'll just draw a quick circle here. This is a, a time when I might put snap on when I'm first drawing the flooring because it's convenient that it will snap me to a vertex to start. Um, so I can just draw, say, a circle. And it's also helpful, you'll see as I move this, that in the yellow numbers, it's showing you the dimensions of what you're drawing. So if you want a perfect circle, you can make sure it's it's even, like at 8, 8. But if you are drawing something less, sometimes it's very helpful to understand the dimensions that you're doing for other decisions you'll make. But we'll just draw a circle. So we draw the circle and unsnap it. And you can see that we you know, get this cobblestone uh, look with this kind of like cave floor, um, which kind of looks more dirty and not as smooth um, as, as, say, something like the smart stone. If I did smart stone and drew the same uh, circle, um, then it would have more of this like square look. Um, you could even have a tighter square with this floor. So there's a variety of flooring options or even just wood if I wanted to have a wooden floor. Now for all of these, the other thing, and this was another thing that took me a while to understand, is that you can change the color of any of the flooring that you want to use. So if I want darker wood, um, you'll notice that down below, and unfortunately it doesn't have like a you know label like color, so it's not inherent uh, apparent, I don't think, right away, that that's an option. Uh, so, But if you click on this, you'll come up with a color spectrum, and you can just go and pick whatever wood color you want. So if I were going to make like a richer color, maybe like a, you know, a, a cherry or something, or a mahogany or something, then I would just pick my color accept that. So now that's my color of wood. And if I redraw this, then you'll see that my woods change to that color. So that's really helpful in creating different looks for your maps. So that if you're making a really expensive uh, noble manor, you can pick maybe very expensive, rich wood colors. Um, if you're making some broken down building, for example, I could pick like the, the wood damaged and maybe I want it to be more on the gray palette, dark and gray. Um, so it has a, a real weathered and you know, bad feel, right? So I think from a mood perspective and creating the look and aesthetic that you're looking for, changing the colors of the various flooring you're using can go a long way toward very quickly making, making an impression upon your viewer of what kind of building we're in. So the combination of the type of wall and the type of flooring and the color of flooring will go a long way toward creating the look and feel that you want in your, in your creation. Uh, for something like a dungeon, uh, I guess uh, before I guess, uh, continue, one other button um, configuration that took me a while to understand or learn was if you want to carve away something, uh, if you want to either get rid of it or eliminate part of it, you can hold down Alt. You'll see when I do that that my yellow dot, uh, basically in this little corner, will turn to blue. So I'm pushing it now, and you'll see it turns to blue. I'm not pushing it, turns back to yellow. So when I push it and I draw, Anything that I cover with my with my sphere or with with the area that I'm drawing will go will generally go away. Sometimes it doesn't quite do it, but there. Um, what this also allows is some very interesting things where I can create a shape that might not be normally possible or easy to draw. For example, if I want to carve out a section, I can hit Alt and and it carve the area that I want to remove. And then it will basically carve that area out and create you know this kind of more interesting shape for me. And that's something that is hugely useful when I want to quickly make unique or interesting shapes with my walls without having to use this, this sort of polygon tool or having to use the wall tool. The polygon tool would allow me to add you know, additional walls by just like dragging and going wherever I want. And then if I connect back up with somewhere inside this, this structure, and I have to connect back to the main one here, then it will, it will expand that out to the area that I've drawn. So that does allow you to make a custom border or, or create a custom shape that you would want, but I find it very convenient to use the square and the circles and then the combination of those and the alt uh, and that to carve out certain things. For example, if I want, you know, if I want this to be this shape, but I, I want this to be flat, you know, it's easy for me to just grab the square, hit alt, draw the plane that I want it to stop on, 
and it'll just cut that off and give me that straight that straight shot. So that's you know some kind of quick conventions on on the drawing, on the flooring, on the different wall selection. If you want to make uh, changes or choices and things of that nature internally, but you don't want to change the wall, uh, so I've chosen cobblestone for example. If I leave this on, if I change this say to wood. Um, or I leave it on cobblestone, but let's let's say I change it on wood, and I want to change the flooring and part of this floor I've created to stone. If I if I have it on listed on another wall, if I make a change here, uh, I guess in that case it won't it won't change the wall, uh, which is good. But if I do something that will enclose, like expand from where I've already made it, it will change the rest of the wall to whatever I've got selected out here, which I may not want, right? Now, at any time, I can go to my select tool down at the bottom. I know we were going to go kind of incrementally down, um, but down at the very bottom is the select tool, which you also use a lot. If I want to, I can go out and I can select the wall, and then it'll open this menu. And down below, from here, I can also change the color. Or I can say, well, I didn't mean to make it a, a, a wood wall. Um, I want to actually go back to cobblestone. Sounds like we might have a question. Nope, oh, okay. So that's you know some very basics about laying out the floor, laying out the flooring, making some color choices, things of that nature. Now, let's say that I created this and I don't want to use the building tool um, in combination of shapes to change it. I just want to manually change it. So that's where this edit points button comes into play. So I clicked edit points. You'll notice that it turns blue. And now when I mouse over uh, the wall, you'll see it'll show me all the points that are currently on the wall to make that wall that shape. And I can grab any of these points and I can drag it wherever I want. Now you notice the flooring change, and that's because I had the flooring selected over here. If I want to go back to wood, I just make one change, and I'll go back to wood. Okay. So that lets me change the flooring in kind of this dynamic way, which is nice. You can delete points. So if I, I did this and I say, "Oh, I don't like that. I don't. I don't. I just want to get rid of this point." I can just click on it and then hit delete, and that'll get rid of that one point. So this lets me draw, you know, interesting shapes. Also, if uh, I get to a point where I'm like, ooh, I really want this to line up, you know, that, that makes it easy for me. Now, I have Snap-on right now, but I may not want it. I may want a much smoother movement that's not always moving me either to the middle of a square or to the, the vertex of a square. Okay. So this lets me have a lot more manual control over how this looks. Now, one reason you may also want to change this, and I'll, I'll show a quick example. So let me get rid of, of all this. I'll unselect edit points. Um, I'll go back to square. I'll get rid of everything. Well, I'll try to get rid of everything. There we go. So let me build a tight circle, and this will be a good thing to show. So I build a circle like this. Normally, after I've done something like, let's say maybe this is like a guard tower or something of that nature, and now I want to put a door to get into the guard tower. Normally, when I make a, a structure, maybe let me make another section so you can see this play out. Let's make a square. And actually, let's make it the same dimension. So like two by three, basically. Um, if I go here and want to put my door on, you'll notice that it conveniently allows me to put my door on any of these edges. But if I go over to my circle, it's not letting me put my door anywhere. And that's because if I go to edit points, there's, there's not enough distance between any of these two points to fit one of those doors. So if I wanted to do that, I would need to get rid of, I, I would need to expand this, and I'm gonna turn snap off for this purpose, right? Because that, that can get me in trouble. I, want, I, need, I would need to expand these points out so that there's a, enough distance that I could fit a door. So I kind of would have to eyeball it. Granted, it's not gonna allow me the, the natural smooth curve that I want, but at least uh, I would be able to then put you know the door in. So then if I went to pick a door, now you can see that it's letting me do it because of those points. So you can kind of finagle that. Um, if I expanded the size of the sphere, of the circle, of the dimensions of the room, then obviously as it expands so that there's enough point, the space between the two points of the curve, then uh, putting the door or a window or something like that is no problem. But if you ever find yourself where I've made you know, a curved wall and I want there to be a window there, um, you may find that it's not allowing you to put one, and that's probably why, is because there's not enough space. Snap will also, um, you know, put a, a portal in, in uh, you know, one of its specific locations. But if you're like, well, I don't, I don't want it here or here. I want it, I want it, you know, to put it where I want it. Then you can un, you know, select Snap, and then you'll see it allows you to put that, you know, portal wherever you want. 
All right, so let's get rid of those. Uh, so let's just draw a you know regular room here. So um, I guess let's talk just a little bit about process um, at this stage for me. When I make a building, um, the first thing I want to do is just get a sense. I, I just want the shape of the building. So let's say we'll start with you know something brand new. This is I've got nothing. Let's let's maybe I want to make a oh I don't know. I want to make a tavern or something. So I will start by you know picking what material I want. Let's say I'll start with wood, uh, and I uh, maybe I'll do wood walls. Um, so let's I'll just maybe draw something like this, and then I'll say okay, well I don't want it's not just one giant box. There's going to be some other things here. So uh, to make it visually more interesting, uh, maybe it's got kind of like a little section over here. So I'll, I'll expand it a little bit. Um, if I want a different shape as a part of it, maybe it's maybe this edge is curved out or something like that. So I might start over here and draw something like that so that this section expands out and gives me that curve, All right? So now this is a little more interesting of a shape to me. And maybe I want this to like even up. It does, I don't want it to be a 90 degree change. So I'll go to this edit points and I'll say, okay, and I want the I want to basically follow that line. And I'll draw that, uh, that triangle and now it'll eat that in. So now I've got a shape that it may be over here as well, right? We'll get some, we'll have no, no sharp angles at these these two sections. So now I have a you know an interesting shape. Um, I don't know why the builders would go this direction, but who knows? Um, I have you know a more interesting shape. So now I've got the exterior kind of done. My next stage then would be I want to figure out what lives in this space and where. I'm a big fan of mixing up flooring types so that it's not all the same thing um, because it helps delineate where I have certain um, purposeful rooms. For example, I tend to make my kitchen stone. So I will, if I want to define where my kitchen is, I might say, all right, well, I'm going to have the kitchen live in this like back right corner. Um, and I need to get off the uh, edit, uh, the, that tool. I want the square tool. Uh, so I will maybe say, I want this to be my kitchen. So I'll have that be stone. And then I'll have a, a storage area and I might want to say, and I'll have the storage be sewer floor, um, which sounds gross, but uh, it will at least, you know, be something a little bit different. Now, visually to me, um, I've got, you know, my tavern kind of proper and I've got my, my kitchen and I've got uh, my, my sewer. Um, I may then also, I'm also a fan, even though structurally or like realistically, this probably wouldn't be the case, but I also like using say this thing called smart stone for hallways um, because smart stone does a very specific thing that's somewhat unique, which is if I have a two by two uh, square of smart stone, you'll, and let me turn off um, wall for a moment. So you can, I can actually select that if I want to draw something, but I don't want there to be walls, I can just select this X for nothing. And then if I come up and draw, you'll see it doesn't draw walls around it, uh, but I still have the flooring. So when I draw smart stone, and if any piece of smart stone has another piece of smart stone uh, diagonal from it, it will, it will have this appearance. But if it's perpendicular only, it will have this kind of combined, you know, mashed look, which to me looks very much like a hallway. Right. But if I if I add something like this, as long as and I guess I'm sorry, it's not dimensionally. It's if it has something next to it and dimensionally. So if I if I have this, it'll be fine as long as it doesn't, you know, touch. But here you'll see because this piece is here and it borders both this piece and this piece diagonally, it won't retain that. If I got rid of this piece, uh, then if I change this to another floor type, then you'll see it, the whole thing would just change. So it can be a little tricky. Um, getting the flooring to look that way, but I enjoy having it that so uh, if I then I would come in here for example and say all right now I want to draw some hallways um, And I, I might turn snap off if I'm coming to a, a room like this So one one convention that uh, it can be tricky when you draw exterior walls if you change the flooring type They will stay true behind the wall no matter if you're you're going between the same square so if I if I highlight this with smart stone, it will not change the exterior, only the interior flooring. That necess won't, but there may be cases where you say, well, I want the wood to continue, or I don't want the wood to continue. Obviously, you know, I want something else, but I can't, I, let's say um, I want carpet. I want there to be carpet out here for some reason. So I'm gonna make, um, you know, walls are off. I'm gonna make this a carpet square. Well, as you can see, this resulted in some weird behavior. I, I not only am I not getting the whole square, but it's also filling in the the interior part with with this color too, and that's not what I want. Um, so you can you can get rid of that 
um, you know, by, you know, using alt that gets rid of, I accidentally hit the wall so I can undo and I'll bring it back. Um, you have to be a little bit careful uh, because obviously it's not making any assumptions about what you want or don't want. So you could use alt to try to carve that out. Obviously sometimes alt still draws and that can be a problem. You can use undo to go back, which will get rid of that. I also, I find, you know, one of the bugs is undo won't actually redo, you know, undo the change interior sometimes. That's an easy fix though, because you can come and just change that back. Um, that's what this pattern tool is for. So the pattern tool will allow you to put um, a pattern outside um, of this. So if I selected this and selected the polygon tool and then did something like this, or I say, and I want it to be here, then I can have that, that carpet color outside of my building without in interfering with this half that I've created. So anyway, back to kind of the workflow. Um, I, want, I, I, want, I, I tend to do my hallways first didn't actually intend to do that. Okay. So, um, you know, I say, all right, I want a hallway. Uh, okay. I made the smart stone by accident. It looks like there. Okay. So maybe I want hallways that go down there. Um, just, I don't know, have it go into that for no good reason. Um, maybe it'll come up here and maybe back here will be where I have all my rooms of the inn. Um, maybe this will lead out to the common area and, um, I'll have another hallway that comes down here like this. So now I've kind of got, you know, walking paths through my building, which gives me a better idea of the spaces that I'm working with. So now I might use my wall tool and that's the next one on the design tool. So I'll go down to wall and I'll pick, you know, obviously I want to pick the same kind of wall that I'm using here. Um, and, and I'll go back to snap because that makes it much more convenient for me to be able to draw the walls. And then I'll just wall in these areas. Now, I may not intend this to be one gigantic room. I don't really care at this point. I just want to frame these and get that done. Now, you'll notice when I have snap on, I can't conveniently stop in the middle here where I've made this, this slanted wall. So that's not a worry. I'll just go ahead and go um, past it rather than go all the way. In fact, I think what I'll probably do instead is, is go around here like that. Um, and then we'll enclose our kitchen and our storage will, I think I'll keep this whole half open and then make this a room. And then again, same kind of thing. I'll, I'll enclose this, but I'm going past the wall. Now to fix these little areas where I've gone past, um, I can take snap off. I can click edit points. I'll zoom in using the control and the mouse wheel. And then you'll see I can pick a, a point here on the wall and I can just slide it back behind the wall. I'll go around the edge, make sure everything else looks good. This one needs to get changed, so I'll change that. All right, so now I've got all the walls acting as they should. Everything's enclosed, the nice, uh, the outside is uh, looks nice, and I've got my kind of different dimensions. So now I might decide where, what are all these different built, you know, rooms gonna be for? So I think we'd said these were gonna be, you know, bedrooms that people could use uh, for an inn. So I may say, all right, uh, I'll go back to snap because it's convenient, and I'll draw some more walls. Um, I'll take this off edit points, so I'll let me draw again. And so let's just say I'll split up some rooms. So there'll be some some small rooms. Um, maybe I'll, I'll have some access on this level too. So maybe we'll do something like this. And then we'll do something like this. So now we've got a mixture of kind of small rooms, big rooms, a big nice, you know, maybe this is their best room. Um, this maybe is a private room that people could rent or something like that. Um, I don't know what we're going to do with this yet, uh, but it's not that important. Um, so from here, then I would probably go and use the next one, which is the portals. So portals is all your doors. And um, you'll notice up here we have block light. So um, for doors, I generally choose block light. If I'm doing windows, then I will not block light because you can get some really nice effects that way. Uh, so uh, you know, you'll develop your own conventions. I, from doing maps, have created my own sort of um, use types for these doors. For example, exterior doors, if they're not like big fancy doors, I will generally use like this reinforced looking door. Um, interior doors will be this, you know, easier, smarter, lighter door. Um, if it's like a bathroom and I have a whole bunch of these, especially if I have these tightly packed next to each other, um, then I might use this as a door for the bathroom or something just to differentiate it. Um, but if we use this door and then we come in here and make some decisions, um, I'll say, all right, well, we'll put that door there and that door there. I think in this case, we're, so I have a choice here and I'll, this will be kind of a workflow thing. I have a choice to put the door wherever I want here. 
Um, I could put it on this side, um, but we have this kind of end of this hallway, and we have to decide what we want to do with the end of this hallway. This, all of the space you're using in this, and this is getting a lot beyond just Dungeon Draft, this is more like design aesthetics and things of that nature. Um, but I would, in this case, this would be a great area for me to put like a bathroom. It's an exterior wall, meaning they can drain outside of the building and stuff for people who care about plumbing and all that kind of business. Um, but I could put the door here, and that would allow me to come in and put another wall right outside it, and then put another door there. And so now this guy can make this into a bathroom with assets, right? So now I've got my rooms, and there's a you know shared bathroom. And if I really wanted to, I could make this a bathroom up here too, so they could have two. Um, or I could make this a door leading outside, which is more likely. But those are the kinds of things that you may want to make decision-wise about where you're putting what. Anyway, we'll go back. So now we've got that defined. Um, we'll go and put a few more doors. Um, we don't need anybody coming into our storage area from the outside. I think it's fine if they just enter it from the kitchen. So we'll have that. Um, we'll maybe put one door here um, for our kitchen. And then out here, um, you know, since this is a fancy place, uh, you know, let's have a big door, right? It's the front door, so we'll use this, this double door. We pick, you know, these two double doors like so. And maybe they try to stay a little fancy on the way back. So we'll have instead of you know two double doors, there's kind of like this smaller one square double door. So we'll pick that at the back. And then over here, you know, this was our kind of rentable room. So uh, maybe that's accessible uh, from the main common area. Uh, and then this area, let's just say these are more rooms. That's easy enough for the purposes of today. So these will be more rooms that people can rent. This could be something cool um, into a different room, but it doesn't really matter, I suppose. We'll just we'll just make all those the same. So then, you know, sometimes it, there's a tendency to say, oh, I'll have these all in the same row. Um, that can be good, but it can also get a little busy door wise. Um, so sometimes I'll say, oh, okay, I'm going to make the access to this building in this hallway instead. So it's not right across from here. So I can kind of mix up. I will also try to keep doors staggered so they're not right across from each other. I don't know if it really matters, but aesthetically, it's just something that I like to do. Um, and then we'll just say these guys can get in on the back this side. These people can get in their door here. And then we've got this pretty well laid out door wise. Okay. So um, obviously cave tool. We'll I'll, I'll once I've got this kind of uh, finished out and we've shown you some of the rest of this. Uh, we'll go and draw a cave and and show what that looks like. Um, but that's that's flooring. That's walls. That's drawing doors. You know, that's that process. And so this was a very kind of quick run through of my process for if I'm going to make a building, uh, what's my thought process? I make the main shape first, then I fill in my hallways, then I decide what rooms should be what by, by surrounding them with their walls. And then I kind of go in and, and further define what I think those rooms should be. And then I go and add my portals. Now I haven't added my windows. So if I could choose a window, I will. And I'll choose the not block the light. And I'll put one on either side of the front here. And then I will go and grab light, which is our next section down, um, and just show you the difference. So on the light tool, you have two options. You can change the environment, which is basically to make it like dark you know, or light. And you can also add tints, right? So like this is, I don't know, like a, the red light district or something. You could add a little bit of a red tint just to reinforce that. Um, or you could just have it be you know, white or gray um, for kind of pure light. Uh, and then you have the light tool. The light tool is awesome. I use a ton of this and this for the person who mentioned wanting to understand more about my aesthetic. This is a key part of it. Um, lighting can go a long way to making your map look way different. We'll kind of see how that works. In this case, you have a color palette. Again, it gives you some standard lights to use. Um, I, I tend to use this light um, the most uh, because I really like that color. You'll notice when it starts, this, this little, I don't know, target looking light is not actually this what's highlighted for some reason. This is soft light, but this is actually, it's displaying fragments. I don't think I ever use fragments. I'm not sure when I would. Um, I don't really tend to like it aesthetically. I use point and I use soft light. Soft light is much more well distributed. Looks a lot more like just natural light coming off an object. Um, point light, I will describe a little bit. I use this to highlight light sources um, or to make effects like a magic sword or something like that. And I'll kind of show how that works. So I'll go back to soft light. Soft light, you know, you have two things you can, well, you have a handful of things you can control. You can control the color. You can control the range of the light. So if I make the range, you know, I can make it gigantic, right? So that's streaming through. You could, you know, simulate sunlight or something like that with this through range. You can then do intensity, right? So now it's extremely bright. Those are the, the, the main things. You can turn shadows on and off. So if I don't want shadows to come through, but I want the area to be lit. 
You know, so it still lights the whole area. It doesn't stop at the walls, but it won't create like light coming through a portal, which maybe you don't want that effect. I think that effect's awesome, um, especially when you're drawing buildings. So I would keep that. But that's the difference is the door is, is block light. So as you can see, the light won't go through. But since the windows are uh, allowing light, then it allows that. So we'll go back to light in a little bit. Um, so we will go back to our portals. And we'll just place you know, a handful um, of additional windows. So let's just say we want a couple here and a couple here. And we'll put one there. And then each of these guys deserve a window. Rich room gets two. Uh, now these guys, you know, they they kind of, uh, I guess they're you know they get out of the kitchen, so they get some good smells. And uh, these guys are just gonna you know get windows interior and get some airflow, but uh, it's not ideal. Now this is a case where I might not use snap. Snap will let me put a window here, which is right next to the other walled section, or right here, which is right next to the door. Maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want my own spacing. So I go down and unselect snap, and now it lets me place the window wherever I want because maybe aesthetically I want it right in between those two wood pieces. So that's, a, that's an instance when I would like unclick snap to, to do that quickly. But in general, snap allows me to, to place stuff really quick, so I would, I would use that. Now in this case, kind of strange, snap is not allowing me to place a window here like in our bathroom. Maybe it's because it's slanted, probably not. I don't know why exactly. Maybe it's because of this other wall that we have that's, that's taking up some space here, that could be. Sometimes if you unselect snap, it will let you kind of override some of those decisions. So here, for example, you can see now it will let me put it. Now it's not perfect, you know, kind of draws, it gives you some weird, you know, shows the end of this wall and it's no longer layered, no longer part of this other wall. Um, to me, that's fine. I'd rather have the window there than not. Um, and you could probably make some other choices, but it's not a big enough uh, thing for me to care about. Um, so we'll add a few more uh, windows, put it back on snap because it's quick. All right, so now we got, and there we go. So we got plenty of windows, we'll put one there too. And here we go. All right, so now we got our windows, we have all our doors. And now um, I would go basically through and begin populating it with stuff. So that is the third one down. Um, the second one down is all about terrain, and we'll go over that. I generally worry about terrain after I've made the building. Um, I just kind of keep everything outside the same until I've got my building set up the way I want it, and then I will do terrain after. That's only my personal workflow, so we'll go back to terrain after we've kind of finished with some of the basics in the middle. I'm not going to address this whole area because uh, that would probably take too long, and I really just want to use it to demonstrate certain things. So in this case, we'll go ahead and dress, which is my term for putting all of the objects where they're going to go. So we select the object tool. I almost always exclusively use object tool. There is scatter tool. Scatter tool is if I have something like, you know, grass. I'll go down here um, and I want to put a bunch of grass places. Then I can select a grass uh, asset. And then if I, um, you know, hit the mouse button and move and well, actually, I don't know. Should just, it should just be, oh, okay. Yeah, it's just randomly putting things every few movements. Um, if I ch in increase the spread, I believe it will start putting them more often. Or no, uh, I see. It'll, it'll put less. There we go. Less frequently. And this is for if I don't want it. Now, I've got scatter on. So as you can see, it's, it's putting them all in the, in the kind of a perfect grid. Uh, so obviously, if I took snap off and did it, then, then it'll, it'll, it'll create like all this grass. So if I want to create something with that tool, that's an easy way for me to use that to create some nice effects without having to hand place every single one of them. So I'll undo all of that. Um, object tool uh, lets you place one at a time, which is what we'll do here. So um, I'll just dress one of these bedrooms and kind of show you that process. I'm um, actually, you know what? I'm going to dress the kitchen because that will show some layering. And that is one of the questions that people had. So a key thing to keep in mind about when you start putting assets down is, are, am I going to be layering a bunch of things? If the answer is yes, if I'm literally not just going to say, okay, this room has this table and, and this chair, and we're done. A gigantic, look at that. Gigantic chair and a little teeny table. Uh, I'm done with this room. If that's the case, then you really don't have to worry about layers. Um, most of the case, that's the time that's not going to be the case. For me, my general you know, rule of thumb or way I operate is layer one, I reserve for things that are on the floor. Carpets, mm, potted plants. Um, anything that is, I, I am going to need to be under something. And the reason is, even though you have a, a below, a, an over and an under, you can start to get into some trouble. And I'll show you how you can get into trouble. 
So let's say I stay on layer one. I pick my, I pick a table. This wouldn't be in the kitchen, but let's just say I pick a, cave, a table. And then I go up and pick some, uh, and, then, and then I say, oh, and I, you know, I want there to be some carpet, uh, but you know, it could be a tablecloth. I mean, you just be creative. And that's gonna be on top of it. So I put my little tablecloth on top. And then I also want there to be you know, carpet on the bottom. So I, and the carpet will be a different color. I'll pick this color, I'll make it bigger, right? And it's gonna be on the bottom. Perfect. So now I've got my table, I've got the tablecloth on top, I've got my carpet on the bottom. That's great. Now I'll go and do my chairs. So let's go find my chair. And now I'm gonna size that down. I found that 0.73 is a good chair size in relation to this like five feet. Um, that's what I use. So now I want it to be, un so I could do over and that'd be fine, but oh, now it's on top of the table. Okay, well, and this is outside, that's not as good. I want it to be under the table. Okay, under the table. Oh, oh let's see, because the table's layer one and the carpet's layer one, it won't allow me to put the chair above the carpet but under the table, right? So this is a reason why you need to build out your layers appropriately um, to give yourself these design decisions. So in this case, and I'll show you one more step. So, so here's our sad chair under the carpet. We'll put a couple of sad chairs. And then another thing that you'll find is if you're gonna stack things on the table, for example, if I say, all right, I'm gonna put a candle, uh, a little uh, candelabra on here. That's over, it's on top of the table, perfect. Bam, looks great. You know, I want something underneath, I want there to be a tablecloth like in the middle or something. So I'm gonna go grab my, my other tablecloth, like that's this cloth, I'll grab this thing, and I want that to be underneath it. So it'll be that, it's gonna be white, it's gonna look great. Uh, no, I need it to be under, bam, it's under everything, right? Because it's all layer one. And when you're doing layers, it, layer one, it's, it's only under and only over, and it's, it doesn't remember that this object was under this object, right? But over that object, it's only at the time you're placing it. Do I put this object under everything else that's layer one or over everything that's layer one? That's all it's deciding. So I have no way now to put this underneath the table, the, the candle. If I'm, you can be, you can achieve this. Um, so it's not that you can't do it. The way I'd have to do it is I have to be purposeful about how I put things down. Meaning I have to put this over first. So let's say I put this down. Also, there's a shadow. I'll mention that. Shadow is great to put on things like tables, chairs. I don't tend to put it on things that lay flat and wouldn't have a shadow, like carpet or tablecloths. So I will turn that off. Um, and then I will basically put that in here. So let's say I have my little white cloth. And now when I do that, um, I can go and check my candle and I can put that on top over layer one. But my problem is all of these are layer one. So how do I fix that? One is you can select any object with the select tool. And you'll see that a few things pop up. One, I can delete it. I can copy it. I can change layers. I can change if it has a shadow or not. And I can change the color if it's colorable. And I'll talk a little bit about colorable items. So now, in this case, I can you know, slide my chair out um, if I change it to layer two. Then if I slide my chair back, you'll notice that it goes over. However, I still have a problem, which is, well, my table is layer one. So now my chair is over layer is over my table. The other thing that you don't have, which is a little, you know, is too bad, um, is that you don't also have the over under choice at this point. You only have it when you place it. So you have to be a, li a little careful when you're placing assets, when you choose what layer, and also when you choose over under. In this case, if I want to fix this problem without having to do everything again, then I need to go and change basically ultimately everything that's above this to a different layer. Now, if I were, if I had made this mistake and I want to make it the easiest possible and I wasn't going to have anything else on the table or I didn't have a lot more on the table, then what I would need to do, because everything will retain its relationship, meaning if I come here and select all of this and change everything from layer one to layer two, everything will stay under itself. It will retain kind of the hierarchy that I originally created, which is really helpful. Um, for, for certain things. So if I select it all again and go to layer one, right? Now they're all back to layer one. Um, so which would allow me to do things like, well, uh, in this case, I can't quite get to, um, the, to select the candelabra and the white cloth without selecting everything else. So I'll have to do it one at a time. And I'll show you what can happen if you do them in the wrong order. So let's say I select the tablecloth and move that up to layer three. 
well, now I now I missed the candelabra because I've, I've moved this that was underneath it up and I can't actually select it. I have two choices now. I can move it to get to it. I can move this out of the way, go back here and select this, move this to three, and then move this back because it remembers its original relationship and now it works. <laughs> or I could have just done the candelabra first. Anyway, um, to get what I want, I need to move all of this stuff above the carpet to a different layer so that the chairs can fit. And the chairs need to be, because they're right now they're, they're at layer two, but if I move them to layer one, they are originally placed underneath the carpet. So really to fix this, you know, what I have to do is I have to change this to like layer three. I have to change the table to layer three. And now my layer two chairs, oh, I need to change all the chairs to layer two. Now my layer two chairs will, should, all slide underneath my table. Like so. So that's that's a kind of a, a real quick rundown of the problems you can run into with layering and why it's important to make good layer decisions from the beginning. Because that wasn't that much work, but if you start making really complex things or a lot of things and you've made that same mistake a bunch of times, that ends up being a lot of fixing. So that's a that's a you know quick thing of how those layers work and, and decisions I would make. Now, you can fix things like, well, okay, I, I don't want to go back and change everything. So I made the mistake of making all this layer one. You do have options like you can make this below water and now it will be below layer one and that will then fix that problem for you. Um, obviously, if you're going to have water in your uh, kitchen, that's not going to work, but most of us don't, uh, hopefully, so that'll be fine. Question? Yep. So... Um... That's really helpful for for, uh, for objects and the like. Um, and um, maybe you'll get to this when you start talking a little bit more about like um, more terrain more terrain features. But I guess layering for terrain as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. What like do you have any rules for what goes where and where you put things uh, on uh, like on what layers? Sure. I don't get um, you know. So we we can do a quick terrain. Um, so. We'll jump into terrain. So basically in terrain, you have a terrain brush, which gives you um, access to make like, you know, dirt and cracked earth and dry grass and things of that nature. Um, these don't they don't have layers. You have, you have these four, you know, choices um, that you can use um, and stack upon each other. So for example, I can have some grass. And because it's the first one, that's the only one I had. So it changed everything to that. All right, if I go up here and change this back to dirt, it'll change everything again. Um, if I then, and this one instead, say I want this to be grass, so now I can draw some grass right around this edge. So for like layering terrain like this, um, it's really just like stacking it on itself. So maybe I'll have some gravel, you know, because there's, you know, I don't know, people have been walking around, so I'll choose the gravel and I'll like, you know, I'll, I'll add some initially. And I might add a bunch first, knowing that I can come through later with back on the on the moss and I can kind of just tap it. And you'll see that tapping it kind of gets gets makes it a lot less thick. You can control that by controlling the intensity. But then I can make something like this. So like there's there's texture. There's definitely like some stone out there mixed in with the grass, but it's much more evenly distributed and random and, and looks a lot nicer. Um, maybe I feel like there's a path that goes along the exterior of the thing. So I would just hold down right, that pathing tool and walk around the exterior. So I might have something like that. But as you leave the path, obviously grass has grown up because people aren't walking all over everything. Um, so for terrain, that's how, that's how I, you know, quote unquote stack terrain, is you kind of use, you have these four terrain options that you can add some various things into. And you can use these in a, in a combination to create whatever effect you're looking for. Um, another thing I might do uh, maybe would be add like you know, dry grass or something like that. So maybe there's some patches uh, somewhere that, you know, have a little, aren't, aren't as healthy or something. I would use, you know, those, that coloring to, to establish a mood. If I were making a swamp or making some forest area that is not um, super healthy and vibrant, then I would probably throw in a lot more of the like dirt and a lot more of dry grass mixed in with a little bit of green to give me, you know, that dirtier feel. But if I feel like it's very healthy and lush and stuff, and I may only use green. Then the next thing you have is your water brush. Uh, water will tend to go over most things. There isn't a level choice in water. Um, you have brushes, so you can just go and, you know, change, uh, go and add water like that. You can draw water, you know, like I want a pool. 
Um, incidentally, uh, this is kind of a trick that I use. If I want to draw a wall with the wall tool, I don't want to actually make a new, um, I don't know, like maybe there is maybe there's something outside of here that I want to make a wall around, but I don't want to actually make any flooring, but I want to, I want to, it to be the best circle that I can. Rather than try and hand draw it, I will sometimes use like water, for example, as a as a tool, as a guide. So I will draw a circle to give me the best like real circle possible, right? Not intending to keep the water. I just have the water like this. Then I go to the wall tool and select what, what I want, turn snap off, and then I will use it to follow the edge of the water. And you can make more points, right? So it's even more smooth if you want. But that ends up giving me, you know, a pretty decently, you know, spherical wall shape. And then if I want, I can come back and go to water and then um, basically use alt and surround my water and just get rid of it. Didn't quite get rid of all of it. There we go. So that, and, and that give, ends up with me with having like this nice fence or this nest, uh, wall that I didn't want to have flooring around or something. So that's, that's a, a little kind of a hack uh, that I use to draw, you know, I, I can use a layer of water to help me draw certain things on interiors, for example, too where I can't draw new walls. You know, I can't use the build tool. The building tool won't let me draw a new wall interior. I have to use the wall tool. And if I'm not good at just eyeballing a sphere, you know, shape perfectly, then I can use water to do that. All right, so let's go back over here. So um, water shape, you control, uh, basically you have um, two colors. This is this, the first color will be what the interior of the water looks like when it gets deeper. And the ex this will be the exterior of what the, the river looks like. So if you have a really thin river, whatever you pick here, uh, picking two disparate colors will help uh, highlight that even better. Um, so if I do this, so you'll see it's mostly red because red is the exterior color. And then as it gets deep, like it you know picks this, this blue color. So that's how you can kind of get interesting mixes to represent the, the mood you want. So if I want it to be like a swamp, then I might pick the exterior color to be, and it has a color wheel to be like, might be like a brown, something like, like that. Um, and then maybe like a green, like a darker green or maybe like a gray green, something ugly. And I could kind of get like a swamp feel. Or if I want it to be, you know, um, like a deeper lake or something like that, um, then maybe actually, uh, you know, I pick something like that. So there's a, that's just how they work. You could obviously play around with it all you want. Um, you can you know shrink and, and change your brush. You can hit Alt at any time to get rid of pieces of it and carve out pieces, right? Using the same brush. So I put in a brush. I hit Alt. It's yellow. It's drawing. It's blue. It's erasing. So it's pretty quick to you know add in. So so if I say oh, I want you know I want a river here, you know that's it's you know pretty two seconds, right? Okay. There's 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 a or edge of a lake, you know. So here's my edge of my lake. I want to draw it so there's, you know, it's got, it's not straight. Okay. So that's, that's one choice that I have. And then um, terrain will be uh, underneath water. So if I want to draw, you know, terrain, then, then maybe dirt won't, won't have, like be, you'll see here, like it kind of, like, I see like I'm kind of chasing terrain away with the dirt. The dirt will kind of have a, a neutral representation underneath water. Um, you'll also notice that the water, you don't see a lot of rippling in the water, and that's because there's nothing really underneath it. Um, by adding just a handful of things, you can make water look really awesome. So if I add, say, sand, um, if I go and pick uh, this, the sand type, although let's not change our, our green. Let's go down and use this for sand. All right. If I use sand, then I can, you'll see that it also populates inside the, the water a little bit. So kind of like a shoreline, like as it, it, it can give the sense of it tapering off, right, into the deeper parts of the lake. Then if I want to use the gravel and add some of that, then you can start kind of adding rocks and stuff in the water. And I'll add, you know, some more out here. You can always remove more and, and, and create a much less dense distribution of that by simply going and selecting say dirt here and then I'm, I'm lightly pressing I'm just like doing literally like one one mouse click at a time to diminish right how dense the rest of it is just to kind of even it out maybe it's a little more dense like at the shoreline but less dense as you get out something like that 
Now, as you can see, because there's objects, something underneath the water, you can see all the cool, like shimmery, watery effects, which don't translate when you do a print map or something, but it's really cool when you're looking at it and you're building it out. I think it, it, it makes the, the program and makes your map look really nice. Um, and obviously you can then put assets underneath the water. Um, and we can, I can show an example of that. Um, then the next thing down you would have would be your material brushes. Material brushes do have layers. So you can put them below ground, you can put them below water, you can put them on any of the one, two, three, and four. So for example, if I were doing a cliff, then I would do something like, you know, layers of this um, or uh, layers of pathing tools. Um, and you can, do, you can do cliffs with either. Um, I'll show kind of a difference of what you want to use um, one for one, one for the other. So for example, if I used uh, rock tile, rock tile, you know, will make these, like if I want an island out here, rock tile can be kind of cool. Um, so it's, you know, this is underwater, right? So maybe I have like a, some land form underneath the water, but now I want to go on top of water because some of this comes up over the water. So that kind of looks cool, but you'll notice that the water doesn't really have any like ripples or edges along the edge of it. So if you wanted to do that, then the, from a layering perspective, right, then I may want to go back to my water, pick a brush, and then what I want to do is get rid of the water that's actually underneath just this section of rock. So that what I, what I ultimately want is I want the water to end right where this rock is starting. And you'll see the difference of what that, that looks like. So if I use the, the tool to get rid of the water along the edge, you can't really see because it's kind of behind the rock. You can see if I, if I push it out just a little bit. But what that, what that tends to do is the color changes, right? So you, it shows that you're more you're up against some landmass, and so it's shallower. So you get that bright color instead of that deep color. And you also get, it'll draw like some of the little ripples and stuff that, that are around it. So I find that that's a way to make it look a little, a little nicer, a little more real. Um, you know, maybe this rock has another rock over it, right? So then I want to go back to my materials brush and pick layer two. And now I can put, you know, a rock on top of the rock, right? So I can layer you know, multiple rocks. So in that way, I could, maybe we're next to some over here, uh, maybe we're next to some, you know, mountain pass, right? So I draw a few of these and, you know, maybe, maybe I change the layers, you know, so now there's, there's, you know, another, there's a whole like path up there or something like that. And maybe there's even like, you know, a third layer, it just goes up. You can kind of do whatever you want. But that's, that's how layers on this kind of terrain would, whoop, would work. You can kind of stack them on top of each other, and they would interact with any other layers that you're you're working with. So, for example, if I went to an object and I wanted a ladder, so let's go down and find the ladders. So here's a ladder. So obviously, if I was at layer one, like it'll be over that, but it'll be under layer two and under layer three. So I can pick a ladder to go up layer one, but I'd have to pick a layer two ladder to go up my layer two, and a layer three ladder to go up my layer three. And then obviously, if you wanted to do this, you could like do some forced perspective by like, you know, making each ladder slightly smaller as it goes up. Um, then the other uh, material brushes, you know, you have are, are, are all really cool. Right? You got ice, which is awesome. Gold, if they, you know, a big dragon horde or something. You've got this for like streets, uh, can be real or squares, anywhere you want to put a bunch of paved. Uh, tile or something of that nature. You've got grass, so you can go and add a bunch of grass. When, and that's nice because you can't put um, your your terrain. I can't draw like moss or anything on top of that. But I can put, you know, grass on top of that. Uh, you know, lava. You know, acid, you know, things like that. Um, so those are all options that you have um, with the with the terrain tools. Um, pathing tools, super awesome. Let me get rid of some of the stuff that we've done since we don't have ice and horde treasure and lava and all kinds of other good stuff outside. All right. So um, pathing tool, pathing tool obeys all the layers as well, which is which is very nice. Um, and there's all kinds of cool options. One of the coolest options are stairs, which just got implemented, I think, two versions ago. So now, um, you know, you can put winding stairs right inside. 
So if I wanted to say, you know, if I wanted stairs going up, instead of going and finding a select tool uh, for the stairs, um, let's say there wasn't a, or I got, you know, there wasn't a window here or something, then I can just draw some stairs going up here, right? Which is nice. Or if I wanted it to be fancy, I can turn snap on and I can say, I want, you know, stairs to come up here and, and go up, up to a second level. Um, obviously there's, you know, things like, you know, blood trails, you know, which can be interesting, uh, chains, right? Draw bridges or anything like that. Um, cliff tools, super, super useful. Um, basically, uh, yeah, you can only draw one way. So I have to, you know, draw the right way to, to make it look like there's a cliff on this side. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the reason why I would use this instead of the material of the stone is that this allows you to, uh, retain the fact that you can put um, terrain on top of it. So if I say um, this, there's, this is a beach on top of here, right? Then I can come here with a terrain tool and I can add my beach on top of it, which I can't easily do with this. Okay. So that's super. And you can, and obviously um, I can go back to my path tool. I can select that and I can go up a layer and then I can draw, you know, another, another layer. Uh, there's, you know, wood fence, train tracks, more other train tracks, uh, rope, you know, which is useful for all kinds of neat, neat purposes. Um, I have done something in rooms before where, you know, say I've got this room and I want, I don't know, after doing, you know, 50 taverns or whatever, you try to mix things up and do different stuff. So one might be, I'll, I'll, I'll change this to layer four. I want it to be under the wall, but I want it to be easy to put over objects. So, um, and then I maybe turn snap off or something. And so then maybe I just, I'm gonna string some rope, you know, across the, the ceiling like this. And then I might say, and I'm gonna go grab an object now, and I'm gonna grab like some lanterns and I'll size those down and I'll put those on layer three and then I'll, I'll hang those like, you know, underneath my rope so to speak, right? And so that's, you know, that's a potential interesting use of like a pathing tool to create something like that. Back to the tools. Um, you know, all kinds of little bridges that are super useful. Um, fences, you know, if we, if we wanted that fence out here, uh, let's say this tavern, you know, keeps some sheep or something. Uh, let's go out here and get rid of this stuff. I'm hitting Alt and drawing around that to get rid of it. And then let's go to the pathing tool and you know, so maybe they have like a little farm here and they keep some stuff. So they have a little fence. Um, you can change the size of the fence, the width of it, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's a little bit about the you can you can select any of these and, and just get rid of them. Same with these, you can just that's just a path, so you can get rid of that if you want to. Um, but that's just a little bit about that. Does that help answer the question about layering and, and um, terrain? Uh, yeah, actually, that that is super helpful, particularly um, like how terrain always goes on the bottom. So you got to be really careful with like placing anything where you want to still use terrain, like the cliffs. Yeah, yeah. The cliff tool is if you want, you know, if you're going to want to create hills and have things on top of hills and stuff, you can put any assets you want on top of this, or you can put that grass. But you have very limited options of what to put on top of this um, if you're not careful with the with the, the choices. I noticed um, that materials and pattern shapes both use layers. Um, and I'm curious who wins, like what goes on top of what when they're both oh. on the same layer. Yeah, so if you had, um, I don't know, some ice underground or under underwater. And then what was the other one you said? Uh, pat like pattern shape. Yeah, um, let's see. So if we make these both underwater, Uh, I would I would guess the first one you put down wins. Mm, okay. Um, let me let's just test that. I don't really know because I don't I don't mess with it so much. But uh, let's. Nope. It looks like terrain wins or uh, material wins. Okay. All Over right. That. Yep. Interesting. Learn something new every day. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so you just have to be a little careful about what you put down where and how you put it down. Um, I don't do a ton with materials. Um, they can be super cool and make really neat effects, and I, I love maps that make use of them, and I will use it more, but I've been focusing more on the other stuff. So when I, when I make my maps, I tend to use things like the cliff tool rather than this right now. Um, this can be great if you want to make um, like a bandit cave or something like that. So let's let's get let's go back to materials um, and get to the right level. So layer three, I'll hit Alt and uh, and just get rid of layer three. That's that's convenient, right? I can get rid of everything that's layer three and not all the rest of my materials exact same material that's other levels. So it's almost like it's its own thing, right? If I go to layer two and and hit Alt and start drawing, I'll get rid of all my layer two stuff. And I can get rid of my weird, you know, floaty ladders. So something here that you could do, let's, because, and it'll demonstrate, which will be nice. Um, let's uh, let's do a cave, right? So I've got a cave tool. Again, you can change your ground color and your wall color of the cave, your ground color of the cave to be darker, lighter, whatever you want. Um, you have dig cave and blast open, and I'll show the difference between that. But let's say we want a little cave here that lives, you know, inside my my material. Now because it this is probably going to be a problem for me. I might have to redraw this um, because it's it's ground level. So to make this work, I, so here's a great thing where I made a mistake myself. Oh, this isn't working. Oh, I see why. I'll have to get rid of my cave. I'll then have to go to my material, find the right layer, layer one, go here and get rid of my thing that I've drawn, go and do below ground, make my same you know basic idea, and then now go back to my cave tool. And now when I draw, it should make the cave for me. Yeah, which it does. And now I can take this to the lip of it, but you'll see that it retains like the wall of the cave coming out of this this thing, which I you know we might not want. So that's where blast open helps. So I select blast open. I select the area where I don't want it to represent the wall of the cave. And then I just select it. Now I have to have the cave come out far enough so that it looks like the cave entrance is, is passable through this rock. So I can't you know, have the blast open here because then it doesn't look like it actually walks through. And I have to actually remove the blast opens. That's not, all, that's not intuitive either. So for example, I go back to dig cave. I say, oh, oh, I needed to go back out. I'm literally clicking here and you'll see that nothing's happening. And that's because I need to select blast open, hit alt, and remove the area that I removed with Blast Open. So Blast Open is like an actual brush, even though it, it doesn't, you might not think of it as that in that in those terms. So now I come and I don't want uh, the cave. And, and you can do Alt with, with Dig Cave too, if I don't want that, that. Anything that I'm hitting with Alt, you'll see I kind of messed up my walls there for a second. Um, I hit Alt and just draw and it'll, it will have the cave recede. So in this case, I really just want the Blast Open to happen right at the front, and it might take me a couple times to try to get it to work exactly, you know, the way I want it to. But eventually, you know, I can get it like that. And that looks fine. So now I've got my, you know, my, my rock face, and I've got my cave inside and my little cave entrance. Uh, you can also do some tricks that I noticed. So um, I might actually just show you guys another map. Let me save this map real quick. Um, And I'll open one that I, I was have been working on to show you how what I what I did. So I created all these cave tools or all these all these uh, cliffs with the with the pathing tool with that the cliff tool. Um, and I started out layering them, um, you know, layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, or maybe this was even below ground or something like that. So I, I created all that. Then I put the water. Well, that all worked fine. But then I wanted this like water to come down looking like a waterfall. Well, the problem was my water level, these were, this was layer four and layer three and layer two. So water went underneath all of these. So what I found was after I had created all of the layers using layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, um, to create all this you know, striation and hierarchy, I could select all of the layers that I'd created and change all of them to layer un like underwater. And because it, it keeps the hierarchy when you move everything to the same layer, then it retained basically the, the look as if these were all layered to one, two, three, four, but these are actually all below water level. So it's kind of, sometimes you have to kind of do some tricks. 
And then basically I just drew the water up to the edge of it so that it looks like, you know, these are above the water. But actually if I drew, if I continued the water here down, it would go straight over all these cliffs. So sometimes it's more about how you, how you layer in what order and, and, you know, hierarchy that you're retaining and stuff to create the effects you're looking for. And that can take a little bit of effort. Okay, uh, let's see. So we covered pathing tool, material brush, all that stuff. Um, you know, real quick here, map settings, level settings, trace image. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of stuff with this. Obviously, with level settings, you can create more levels. So um, I, if I want there to be a downstairs and upstairs, things like that, that can be really helpful. So let's say I want to add a level and I want to call it's a new level. Um, it's going to be, you know, something new. Uh, I'll call it seller. Okay. So now I've got, you know, a new map. It's, it retains the same dimensions as my old map. And I can swap, you know, in between the two of them. Um, so I can also go down here. You know, so I'm on seller right now. Let's let's move off that, that menu. You know, I'm on seller right now. If I switch to ground, it'll switch to my ground map. I can go back to my seller map. One of the neat things is I can do compare levels. Oh, and Dungeon Draft Craft crashed. <laughs> crashed. Let me uh, bring that back up here. Uh, I, I think, you know, for people who are new to it, you might have read that Dungeon Draft, you know, like uh, it was in beta and you know, it crashes and stuff. Um, it used to crash very often, um, but it is much, much better now. I mean, this is, we've been going, doing all this this whole time. Um, in, in the beginning, that probably would have, I've, I probably would have already crashed us multiple times. Um, now, this is the first time we crashed. And it tends to be when you're doing a bunch of layered stuff and you're drilled in real tight. Um, so let's go back to this. Let me share my screen. saw there were some chat questions here. Okay. All right, perfect. Um, so, right, we were creating those new levels. So we create the new level. Seller. Accept. And then um, hopefully it won't crash us again. Go up, and now if we go down to seller and hit compare levels, okay. So this is really helpful. I can change the opacity between the two levels of the, of the ground level and then of this level. Um, so that helps me see, right, the, the level above this. So I can very easily map something out. For example, I, maybe I don't want it, the seller does is stone, right? So I go up and I'm, uh, so I hit okay. Uh, I go up here, building tool. I'm gonna pick up maybe a cobblestone and a, a, you know, a stone base or something of that nature. Maybe my, my stone seller is really only like this. It's not the whole the whole of the tavern. It's only this section, um, and I'll you know I'd make a stair going up and a stair coming down or something of that nature. Um, so that way, once I've drew, you know drawn this and I know that that's within the dimensions of the building itself, and I feel comfortable, then I can click off compare levels, and now I can just make the cellar, and I can switch between the ground and the cellar you know quickly and easily. So that's 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 pretty nice. I did see they just added something which is a really huge nice feature, um, which is you can clone. The previous level. So one of the issues I had was, you know, I would draw a map and it would have all kinds of exterior stuff. You know, there's there's all kinds of grass and trees and assets and, and whatnot outside my building. And I would create a new level. And the level would be the second level of the house, which means none of the outside would change. Just the house the interior is going to change, but it wouldn't copy everything over. Right, and I didn't want to just have a blank map of the second level without the exterior also. So in that case, I'd have to save out a copy and then basically gut the inside of the house and redo the house. Well, now you can just clone the whole level and then gut the inside of the house, which makes it much easier and it can be part of the same map. So that's nice. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about light, but I know we got, you know, like 12 minutes left in, in the time that we had allotted. Uh, and I want to talk just for a moment um, some, about something that comes up a lot for people is how do I, how do I export my map for, so people can use it? So um, there's a button export. Uh, one of the common things that happens a lot is it tends to default to PNG. PNG files are very big. So a lot of people I've seen comments on, on Reddit and other things where they say, I can't export my map. Because and it can't be used in Roll20 because it's you know 15 megabytes. 
or something and it's too big. Um, so one, one real quick and easy fix is you can just change that to JPEG instead. Okay. You can pick which map you're looking at. You can pick if you want the grid on or off. You can change various, you know, brightness, foci. Um, you know, that can be kind of cool to, to put this out of focus, especially if you're going to layer things or something of that nature. Um, you can do camera filters. I don't really do any of that. Um, and then preset features. So here you have a roll 20, you know, and a 40 inch TV and 55 inch TV. And all this does when you click this, before I click it, I'll show that it has grid PPI points per inch. And then it has output of your pixel count dimensionally. All, all me choosing roll 20 does is change this to 70 to ensure that it's probably when I save this out as a JPEG is probably going to save out under, you know, five megabytes, depending on what the size and complexity of what I've made. Uh, I find uh, the, the real restriction for roll 20 is not, it needs to be 70 pixels. It's that it needs to be under five megabytes and same for the pay. It needs to be under 10 megabytes. So generally my process then to make sure I can get something that's the nicest into a free roll 20 would be, I would play around with this value. Like I'd start at 120, I would export it as a JPEG. I would go to, uh, you know, make a, a file, like let's say a new folder for, you know, DD intro files or something like that. Um, go here and say DD intro map. So it does it, it kicks it out. I highlight it. I see the size is 2.47 megabytes. It means I can go higher, right? I don't need to conscribe to that 70. I could probably go up to maybe 180. Do it again. Pick the file, save it, replace it. You know, wait a second. See how long, you know, how big this one is. It's a little bit of trial and error, but I find, you know, all I'm trying to map, you know, match is to get it into the game that I want is to get it underneath. So now it's 4.57. Pretty good. Maybe I'll just keep that. You also have universal VTTs that can go into uh, like VTT Foundry. A lot of people like that because it retains all your walls and it retains dynamic lighting. And that can be super helpful for not having to draw everything out. Um, so I find that to be the main, the main things from an exporting perspective is make sure it's on JPEG to keep the file size small. And then the real thing you're controlling or the, is, is the PPI, the pixels, the uh, grid points per inch. This is going to determine the size of your file. The size of your file is going to determine how good it looks in Roll20 and, uh, and such. Uh, let's see. So I guess in the final eight minutes, I've kind of walked through all of the basics here. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about lighting because I think lighting is super important. Um, so I'll light this room briefly. So what I'll do is I'll use the point light. I will shrink the point light down to as, as little range as possible. I'll change the intensity up just a bit maybe like a 0.7, depending on what I'm going for. Uh, and this is, this is something I would use to light the object that's shedding the light. So in this case, if I have these lanterns, I'll use this and I'll probably do it like a couple times. Click, 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 click. And now, now I feel like this does a good job highlighting what in the room is lit because it has its own little light. Then I will switch to the soft light. I will maybe take the intensity down and then I will chain, put the range up when you use the mouse wheel on range, it does it increments of 0.5, right? And then I would come back in here and I would illuminate the room a little more, okay? And you can see all of your lights. If you go to select tool, you'll see all of your lights on the map. Then you can move the lights around, right? And then when you change, you know, the environment, one way, is this, is this room lit enough for what I want? Is it giving the effect that I want? One easy way to check is to go to your light, click environment, change your ambient light, and just change this from up here in the upper left where you're kind of white down to, you know, black or so. And you can then see at nighttime, you know, how does this look? Does it look good? Is that, is that how, you know, if someone were in this room, would that feel like it's lit enough? Or do I need to work in the dark for a bit, go choose my light tool? and say, no, I, you know, we, we probably need to like stack a little bit more light. Or maybe when I originally chose the light, instead of using 0.5, I need to start using like 0.8 or something of that nature. And maybe, you know, you, you don't care whether it's lit, you just want the, the light coming out to look cool. So maybe I want the intensity to be a little higher, right? And so then I just want a bunch of lights here because I just want, I want that look where there's a bunch of light coming out the windows or something. And obviously you can make those changes and that can have a huge impact on how the map looks in general. For example, I'll open another one that I um, 
had done. So this was the biggest one that I'd done. Um, if I can find it. So this is the biggest one that I've done to date, um, Riverton Hollow, which is like a, kind of a D and D adventure starting town. And um, you know, one of the nice things once I'm done, and this is you know, someone had asked about the aesthetic. Um, so I use tons of lights. If I this is probably going to be a little scary. Who knows if it'll crash it? Uh, if I use select tool, you'll just see how much light there is on all these buildings. And and one of the reasons for that is because it, it achieves some of the aesthetic that I want. For example, um, I added a whole bunch of light. It's going to take a moment here. I added a whole bunch of lights that go around like this fence um, of this uh, noble estate up here on this hill, right? Now during the daytime, you know, it, it, it looks okay. I can see that the light is lit. Um, it's a little bit different than the rest. But if I go and change it to nighttime, Then all of a sudden, you know, you can see it looks really cool. Like it really kind of gives me the feel that this is like, you know, a little lit pathway at night. Um, I can see probably well enough to, you know, have my walk or whatnot um, around the estate. You know, from, I am, I think of the perspective of people from the tavern or something looking up where it's all dark at the base, but you see, you know, the top is all super well lit and nice and, you know, looks fancy. I purposefully lit the temple to be very bright. Right, which you know, you obviously you can see the temple is much brighter and has richer colors and things than say this water wheel. So light can go, light and color choice and things of that nature can go a long, long way toward achieving an aesthetic that is different than you'll find in just kind of, <laughs> excuse me, common maps where they're not making a lot of use of uh, of light. I think places that don't use light are are cheating themselves of a whole layer of your map, of a whole tool set that you have to make your map look and feel the way that you want. And we'll go back. Okay. I'll, I'll show one quick example with light again um, to help highlight what else you can do with light tool. So one thing I use light tool for a lot, let's say I want to make something, uh, I've got a sword and uh, maybe I'm making like a blacksmith shop, but it's a, you know, he's an awesome blacksmith and he's not just making horseshoes, he's making, you know, weapons of power. Uh, you know, I turn snap off, I put this on a table, um, but I, you know, it's not just any sword, it's he's working on a magic sword or something. So this is a way you could use light. Um, so if it's like a generic, you know, the Lord of the Rings sting sword or something, I can, you know, use blue, I change the point light, I up the intensity maybe to 0.8, and then I make a bunch of little lights on along the blade. So I'm just clicking my mouse as I go up the blade. Right now, I've got a magic sword that I can, you know, highlight. Um, you can highlight any object with the select tool. You can, when when you move outside of the blue bounding box, you can just rotate it, and you can rotate the object, you know, wherever you want. You can, you know, increase the size, decrease the size. So you don't have to worry so much about orientation and whatnot when you're first placing objects because you can go and chase anything, change anything you want to. Um, but then, you know, then I get this nice effect um, that I can add to a variety of of, of objects, things of that nature. Another thing I've done before is, uh, you know, I was doing a temple. Um, I went and picked, you know, I thought, well, this whole temple is kind of uh, in trouble except for this one potentially gifted student who figured out like this ward uh, that worked. So I, I, I put a ward on the floor, something like that. I went and got the light because I said, okay, this ward is magic, so it, I think it should be lit. Um, I'll do something like that. And then I think the, the, the whole impact was that he was like secure, he or she were securing the door. So then in that case, I was like, well, the doors like should be looking like magic. You know, like, so I used the light tool to put points on the light. So now I have like a magically secured door behind this, this magic ward or something, right? Just using light. Adds a whole different, whole different feel and flavor like to that, that room now because of just adding a little bit of light in a specific way. So that's just a that's a comment on how you can use light in the tool to make a lot of neat effects and and add a lot of mood and atmosphere and aesthetic and feel 
to, uh, to your maps to make them even more immersive and, and interesting. And we're at one o'clock, so uh, I think that's pretty much all I've got for this. I hope it was useful to everybody. If anybody has any ending questions or anything that uh, I didn't cover, or you have a question of what you've seen, uh, certainly happy to answer them now. Yeah, Rob. Hi, um, so just out of curiosity, the carving tool. Um, so going back to the beginning with the circular tower, when you carved a section out of it, it completed the wall around the bit you carved. Is there a way to carve a section but have the wall not complete that part? So, like, if you had a tower, a part of it's collapsed. If you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. So, let me see. I'm gonna make a new map here. I'll save that. All right. So the question is, can I? Oh, here. Can I take a? Can I take a tower? And can I? Can I take out? You know, just just this, like a section here to to represent that it's it's you know not uh, that it's gone or something um, I don't think so um, there's a couple of options you have if I were gonna kind of if I were gonna rig it I, I don't think I think the answer is no at least I don't know of one um, but there's a way I could do that so the way I would do that is I would take a portal and I would choose this this threshold and I would put that here like this, and I would have it not block light. Let me change that to not block light. Okay. So I would use this threshold. Oops, let me go back. I don't know why I did that. In a couple places, um, maybe something like that, um, as much as I needed. And then what I would do is I would go and find like um, the stone, like some, some rubble or something like that. And I might layer this above wall, and then like you know do do some business like this. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not taking time to make this look very nice, but um, you know, I, I might do something like that uh, to to where it looks like you can just walk on through. Obviously, when you had like terrain uh, underneath this. Um, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll look more open. Um, you, and you can certainly do a better job than I did um, at, at placement of all the rubble and layering of all the rubble um, to make it look. Obviously, you know, if you made this rubble not over wall underneath it, it'll be much more clear that it was broken away. But I don't, I don't think there's a way, at least I don't know what it would be, um, to carve out a section of the wall and have the wall simply just not be there. The only thing that I could think of would be I draw my wall, my, like, let's make another tower, I do this, I hit the select tool, I get rid of the wall, and then I just use the wall tool, and I come back and I, I you know, draw a wall, and then purposefully omit, I'm, I'm drawing a really horrible wall, and then omit the part of the wall I don't want. Okay, thank you. Yeah, obviously this this approach, you know, would, would need more planning when you're drawing the, the your whole um, your whole thing, because obviously when you when you create contiguous you know structures, um, if I add on to this, for example, you know it lets me um, it lets me build out you know some huge massive castle. Uh, later, then I can't come here and just take out this one section of wall. Like if I want to, I you know, that would remove all of the wall. So I'd have to be I'd have to do something different. I'd have to you know do a little bit of planning. But you could you can achieve that effect. With a little bit of you know hackery um, and, and creative use of of portals and stuff. Any other questions? I have one, but I'm not sure if you covered it already. My my sure. headphones went out for a minute. Um, whenever you're laying down objects, I'm watching you kind of move these parts around, and, and it looks like you're rotating with a keyboard command or something. How are you doing that? Yeah, just the mouse wheel. So it's just the mouse wheel as you go. Yep, you'll see. Um, if you look at the rotation um, over here, I'm just I'm gonna move the mouse and you can just watch it. Okay. Yeah, very cool. I, I hadn't noticed. Like I, I saw things moving around as you were going, but I wasn't sure how you're doing it. That's perfect. Yep. Thanks. Yep. So when I like when I do rubble, for example, if I put this underneath a wall, um, I use that a lot. So like for example, this is the same asset, and I'm maybe sometimes I'm just lazy, 
and I don't want to, I don't want to hand click a brand new asset like every time I'm doing it, but I also yeah. don't want it to look the same. I don't want to do this. Okay. <laughs> where, where it's the same pattern, like of three stones or whatever, every time. Um, yeah. so what I'll do with that then is just like click, rotate, click, rotate and, and change how far out it goes. Rotate, 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 rotate. Then looking down here, none of these look the same. Nice. But they're all the same asset. Is there a way to do that with scale as well, or is it just the rotation? Uh, I think alt. Yeah, alt and the, the mouse wheel. Ah, sweet. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? Yeah, um, I have a question. Can you repeat your layering order? Like you said, layer one for carpets, but... Oh, yeah, sure. What about... Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Layer one uh, would basically be like carpets. Uh, layer two, I usually reserve for like furniture, tables, chairs, end tables, beds, um, anything that is heavy and likely would be on a base, like a, a, the, the first thing you get above the carpet. Um, third layer then for me would be most other things. Um, by that point, I've already made decisions about what's gonna be on top, like plates. Um, you know, so I'll just I could quickly just make an example and kind of talk my way through it. Uh, so I've got layer one. So we're on layer one. Um, let me scroll down and just grab, you know, a carpet. So we grab a carpet and we throw a carpet down. And then uh, maybe I'll layer my carpet, okay? So because it has nice effects when I put a carpet underneath a carpet, right? Looks, looks nicer. Um, so then we'll switch to layer two. Layer two. And I'll put down an object. So we'll put down a table. Shrink that so it fits nice. We'll keep the shadows on. I don't really like the shadows on the carpet, so I'm gonna turn those off. So I select them both and just turn the shadows off. All right, put the table on. And now, uh, while I'm on layer two, I will place my chairs. So I'll size them the way I like. And then I will um, have them, uh, they're un it's listed under, so it will go under anything else that's layer two. Um, this is uh, for the rotation. This is another area where I use rotate a lot. So I'll put the chair in like at an angle, put this one closer, put this one further away, put this one out, put this one, you know, rotate this a little bit. It just makes the, tab the, the table look used. Like humans put these back in perfectly. Um, I feel like that looks more, more organic and natural. Um, so I get that. Now I have, you know, now if anything I want to put on the table, I'll just switch to like layer three. So now if I want to put, say, some tablecloth or something like that on it, um, we'll pick like a white maybe. So we'll just put that. Um, I'm usually, and, and we'll turn, let's see, I'll undo that, change, take the, the shadow off. Um, I'm usually comfortable by this point to do them in order. So I can just have everything be over. I'll stack up. Right, so my work order will kind of define my layers for me and not not cause problems. So maybe now I want to put down, you know, like some uh, some placemats or something like that, because that's going to be first. And then anything else I can put on top of it, right? So then I can go scroll up and find some plates. And throw some plates on there. And then I would probably put, you know, like some light source. Uh, so we'll put uh, the candles. I'll go to my lights. I'll pick point. I'll scale this down maybe just to 0.6. I'll do two on each. I'll switch to soft. I'll expand that to like 1.5. I'll maybe do like a light at each side of the table so that the whole table is kind of lit. And then that's that's uh, that's how I would normally do it. Now, if I decide, you know what? Um, all of these, I want something else underneath, you know, all of that. I don't like the white or something. Because I made the table layer two and everything else layer three, I could delete that and then go and find a different. Now, I wouldn't have had to delete it if all I cared about was color, but let's say I don't like that shape or something or that texture and I really want this one or something and I want it to be, I don't know, blue or whatever and I want that to be. I'd have to go three and pick under, but because the table's two, everything else is three, then that should work. Now that doesn't look better in my opinion, but I'm just kind of exercising with it. Uh, layer four, um, you know, is, is if I need it, if I'm building up some really big structure um, that needs to do that, um, or if I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having to do creative layering to do an effect, and I'll show you one example of what I mean by that. So if I make a fireplace, 
I won't do all the rest of the fireplace. I'll just do the actual fireplace. So a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll have a fireplace and I'll put that here. And what I want is I want it to look like the, the fire. There's fire in the fireplace, but underneath the, this, this top wall along, not, 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 not in the curved part or even where like the little like a grayish part is, but under kind of tucked underneath. And that won't be possible with just one asset. What I have to do is, um, and I don't know why I put that on layer four, let's put this back to layer say two. So what I, what I do to create that is I make another, another fireplace and I make that layer three and I rotate it around. And then I put the back of that layer three fireplace over the front of the layer two fireplace. Okay. Now, normally I have like a chimney that blocks this little thing that sticks out. If I couldn't, I just, I put a bush or something over that. Um, then when I go up here and I pick a, uh, like a, a, a campfire or just some, some flaming logs or whatever to put in the fire. Now, if I make this layer two, it will, it will be below the one, um, sorry, I need to put over. It will be over the first fireplace I placed, but under the back of the other fireplace. And now you can see, I can kind of tuck my, my flame and, and, and wood and fire underneath so that it looks like it's in the hearth rather than having to put it like out here somewhere. So anyway, that's just a, a quick layering trick that, that you can use to when you need objects to be hiding underneath another object, but you, you will need to use multiple objects to do that. Anything else? Um, yeah, just say a question about the so using the table as an example. If you've got like multiple assets placed down that you kind of like the look of, is there a way to basically save that so you can replicate it in other maps? Yes. So you so let's say I like this table. Like I, I really like this whole table look, and I want to use this again. So I can highlight the, the all of it. I can hit, I'm hitting control C, so I'm copying it. And then it basically, and I'll have to share my whole screen of uh, everything. So just a moment, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop share. I'm gonna reshare just my screen. And now um, I, I am literally just pasting what I copied into like Word. And you'll see that it pastes like all the code for that here. So if I take this, so now if I highlight all of this that I just did, obviously there were like tons of lights and stuff, so it's a lot. Um, if I copy this, and now I go back into, I'm going to go back into this other one, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, if I go back into this other map, you know, so it's a whole different map. If I go in here, hit the select tool and hit copy, then you'll see that it brings in all of that. Now, I believe there's a new feature coming not too, not too far away that will allow you to save this in, in the game itself and kind of create your own like custom assets that you use a lot. But as far as a, I don't want to have to build this thing from scratch every time, you can build it. Once it's done, copy it and then put it, uh, copy it out and put it into a Word file. And then you can just copy it directly from the Word file back into Dungeon Draft. That's really helpful, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, anything else? Yeah, so sorry, one uh, final yeah, question. Sure. Um, so at the start you mentioned um, Dungeon Draft's good for top-down maps and you mentioned incarnates. Um, regarding Dungeon Draft, what would be like an example where you wouldn't, you would use something else of the Dungeon Draft? Like what would its limitations be, I suppose? Uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't use necessarily Dungeon Draft to make like a, lar um, a, a large village map. Like a, if I, sometimes I, I you know, I, I would want to make a, say a village um, that has a bunch of, you know, roofed buildings. So I just want to show a river and a bunch of buildings and things of that nature. Um, if I were going to do that in Dungeon Draft, I have to, I have to draw all the buildings. I have to build roofs on the buildings and there's no roof layer right now there's no roof asset i have to build all of that um versus me just literally going into incarnate and picking a i don't know a farmhouse and putting a bunch of farmhouses here and putting a church here and putting a whatever here so um if i don't mind using you know pre-created 
buildings or rooftops or something of like that. Now I know you can import assets from other uh, like two minute tabletop that have roofs and stuff, but I would say if I'm making a, a large depiction of what my village looks like um, and I don't want to spend 10 days creating all every, like, you know, a detailed look into every single building. Um, I might use something like incarnate to build that view. But if I, if I were making, you know, I don't know, a nature map or, or the interior, or like a dungeon or a cave or a system of caves or a natural setting or something like that. Um, I think I, I really like the dungeon uh, draft aesthetic. I know some people don't like the cartoonish feel of the assets. I don't really like the non cartoonish feel of like the incarnate assets as much. So uh, sometimes it can be personal preference, but I think you, I think the workflow inside a dungeon draft is faster for the things that it's good at. But I wouldn't try to build, you know, a village that's going to have, I don't know, 50 houses or something like that depicted in Dungeon Draft. In Dungeon so Draft. For, oh, God. Sorry. So for, so for larger scale maps, like your villages and that, um, what do Incarnate be the one you recommend then? Uh, either that or Wonder Draft. Wonder Draft can do it too. But I think Incarnate has better choices. So, yes, for. for an exterior map or a, a village, like a larger scale village map of just what the area looks like, um, the flow of the town, like stuff like that. I would probably use something like Incarnate over Dungeon Draft. Dungeon Draft isn't really appropriate for that. Wonder Draft has things for that, um, and you can certainly make them. I just think Incarnate has done. That's more like its wheelhouse, so it has better, better options um, right now. Wonder Draft, I would use, I mean, you can use Incarnate or Wonder Draft, and it's really more aesthetic and choice and things like that, um, but they're both really good for large-scale maps, like a map of your continent or a map of this whole country or a map of whatever, kingdom. Um, they're both really good at that. So I use Wonder Draft for my landscape-ish um, drawings, not a, not a zoomed-in battle map, but a, you know, this is the kingdom, the whole kingdom. I will use like Wonder Draft for that. If I then want to show this is the city of whatever, I would use Incarnate to make that. And then if I want to say, here's this street in the city and here's you know these four buildings that are you know across the street from each other and I am going to have a fight happen here and I want to create what that looks like in those four buildings, then I would use Dungeon Draft. For my own personal preferences, obviously. Oh, that's really helpful. Thanks for having them. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Let me check chat here. I always forget about it. Okay, yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, I will probably do, you know, um, some additional videos in the future or talks in the future, uh, maybe just on, on specific things, um, you know, maybe making a specific building or creating certain moods or, or feelings uh, behind your maps or something. So if you're interested in that, feel I'll post the same kind of thing I did before. But thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. And I'll post this uh, this video for people who want to return to any of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye now.